Hello, welcome to our show. I'm Brad. I'm Chase. I'm Cray. Today we are talking about antiquated items, things that are still popular today, even though we're not quite sure why they are. They've been holding on for dear life for one reason or another. Things such as film photography, records, fax machines, things that have just been holding on for life and we're not quite sure why. What are some things that you think are around but shouldn't necessarily be? Typewriters. Do you think typewriters are still a thing? Yeah, I do. Well, typewriters obviously had an original purpose. From what I gathered, it was to find a way to input data faster than you could write it down, because writing longhand is relatively inefficient, and that if you can find a keyboard, it's much faster. <laughs> the first first typewriter, as we know today, started in about 1870, and we pretty much used them up until 1980. So typewriters lasted for about 100 years before kind of dying, even though they're not really dead today. They were obviously replaced by keyboards that were easier to use and that could actually be attached to laptops and to computers so you could actually save files on a computer. They're still used today by, I would say, three groups of people. It kind of has a niche market uh, with hipsters, I think that people like to travel around into coffee shops and type up things for whatever reason because it makes them look cool or because they cannot be distracted by having internet near them and they just want a physical piece of paper right after the finish which is by no means convenient because typewriters are heavy they're very heavy i even looked at portable typewriters and they still weigh up to 16 pounds that's pretty heavy yeah like how much does my laptop weigh you have to carry the paper with you and uh if your ink runs out Gotta yeah. have more ink. But the other two groups of people, I believe one of them almost makes sense. The first, uh, which doesn't make sense, is the NYPD. They still use typewriters, and they actually have a contract with Swintech Corporation, which is one of the few typewriting factories that still put these out today in large quantities. In 2009, I think it was revealed that they spent about a million dollars that year on typewriters and maintenance, and there's really no good reason. They do it to type out property vouchers, or in case of malfunction in their electric wear, they will have <laughs> a backup, which is kind of like saying, I know my car broke down, but at least I have two horses in the back for just <laughs> such an occasion. It's costly keep up, but reaction. That's like the dumbest thing I've <laughs> ever heard. How long has the contract been around? I'm not sure, but I would have to assume it's been around for as long as, or at least they've been using typewriters as long as typewriters have been relevant to them because just recently I think they've been voting to ban typewriters and outdated items in the NYPD. So it's still something that they use today for no clear reason besides, oh, our laptops might break, so we need typewriters. But with all those typewriters and all the paper, what are they going to do with all the filing cabinets if they don't use it? Yeah, another thing is you have to store all the paper, you have to store all the typewriters, and people have to type on those. Like, that just seems really inconvenient. The third group of people, it, which I think makes the most sense, is prisoners. So, um, Swintech Corporation, the same one who has a contract with the NYPD, they sell these clear typewriters to people in prison so they can't hide anything in them because it's clear and you can obviously see what's in there plus they can write letters to home in case you didn't want to give them access to the internet or a pen that could be a shiv yes yeah i guess so but they they have a sizable contract i think that's where most of the swintex swintex business is from but other than that, I'm not sure how most make their money. They're slowly dying off, and that's really because there's no reason to use them. Do you think the hipster movement just kind of like bumped up and revitalized it a little bit? I bet it revitalized it, but not to the point of you're going back to the time where every business was using it, because in comparison, these are just a few individuals as compared to many corporations and offices and I don't know, factories. Uh, that had to use them. I feel like, okay, if there's going to be one thing that's going to be true throughout this entire episode is that hipsters are probably the main driving force of keeping things alive that shouldn't be. I mean, I think there's, there's going to be two camps of things that are still around that shouldn't be. Things that really there's no reason to be alive, but people are keeping around for nostalgia's sake and just because they're hipsters. And two, things that are still around because we really don't know why they're still around. Like, the penny and fax machines is just kind of like an outdated... It's just the way we've done things. Let's keep them around. Yeah. 
and maybe a third crowd of people which are hobbyists or historical enthusiasts who just really like old items and that's cool because we obviously need like museums and people to keep these things alive just to say oh this is where we came from this is where we are now just to have that physical evidence of history but i think that's cool because it's for a historical purpose if it's for hipsters would be trying to bring back something that should just be long dead for practical reasons historians are they recognize that it's dead but they just want to appreciate it it's kind of like the civil war reenactors of everything else the civil war ended a long time ago but there's still people that love studying it love keeping it alive but not because it's still relevant but because it's just for because they love it i use my bayonet all the time when i go hunting <laughs> A number of years ago, you actually bought a typewriter. Do you fall in the camp of NYPD, prison inmate, <laughs> hipster, or historian? I I fell under the camp of unpractical... Um, Knick-knack. Knick-knacker. <laughs> You thought I, it was cool. Yes. Okay. To I, use it to, that's the hipster camp. Okay, I didn't want to say it. I'm not calling you hipster. I'm just saying that's what camp you fell into. It was a foolish mistake in my youth, but it only cost me $10. I would have bought one for $10. I push crayon this hole. Let me dig him out. Did you ever once use it? I, no. I never typed. There we go. A hipster would have used it. Cray, yeah. you just like to collect <laughs> objects for no reason. You could have just pulled a Frank Underwood and just wrote one letter oh. that was very influential. I, yeah, I never typed a document on it. I told myself I was going to, but you know why I didn't? It's because it's entirely impractical and printers make this so much easier. You don't have to worry about jams or anything. But fun fact, just related to typewriting, the fastest ever words per minute uh, typed was done in, I believe 1946 by, Stella Pajuras, and she typed 216 words per minute, which was not her sustained time, but in one of those min minutes, she got 216, which is the fastest ever on a typewriter. Impressive. So that doesn't include like keyboards? No, it does include keyboards because, no, it does include keyboards, but it's the fastest one like on a keyboard. It just so happened to be a typewriter. So it's still held today. Yes. That's incredible. That's really incredible considering it didn't jam. Yeah, the thing is back in the 1940s they didn't have they didn't have the IBM Selectrix of the 1960s which just had a ball that could roll on top of the paper so you didn't have to worry about jamming. It did have the bars that would hit the paper so if you did type two at the same time it would jam. So it's equal it's super impressive that she'd get that high of a score, still retain it, with a typewriter that could have jammed. I am impressed. I am impressed too. But you know who's not impressed? The modern society, because we don't need typewriters. <laughs> but that's all I uh, that's all I have on typewriters. Typewriters are only for prisoners and policemen. I, I can't speak on behalf of photographers. I think it's very easy to uh, think that like the old way is best. Like, is there, is there any reason why we would use film over digital? It's, it's interesting. I actually thought that I'd just be like, yeah, it's just, it's just pretentious hipsters holding on to film or just like people who can't cope with a changing medium. But that's not the case. There's a lot of people who do use it. And because of it, we do have a lot of good pictures to look at. But there's always that niche market of people who think that film is better for one reason or another. I, cause usually I... I know some either art or for photography majors and they usually have a class that makes them use a film camera and makes them go through the entire process of producing film pictures. Granted, maybe the professors are just really old and they just haven't heard digital photography. Is there ever a moment where it's just better quality or it just gives a really cool feel to the photograph? In my opinion, you cannot tell the difference. If it's done well enough, you can't tell the difference between film and digital. They're both taken by a professional. So even then, I still think you're saying it's easier to tell if 
a picture was taken by a professional or an amateur. Because I'm sure a... Yeah, megapixels, that's all digital stuff. But I'm sure, to a certain extent, a uh, professional could take a better digital picture than an amateur could with a film camera. So it's kind of like the everyday Joe Schmoes won't care about film photography because it's just too hard and digital photography is adequate. We've been talking this entire time about practicality and photography, it's an art, for, at least for professionals, it's it an is. art. So we kind of have to take practicality out the window. If you want to talk about art, you know, you'd be able to appreciate digital a lot longer versus film. So that I think that's a reason enough to want to switch aside from the art thing, the, the practicality of it. Digital seems to be the way to go with that. But I did see... Uh, this is with this is with like uh, movies and um, you know that kind of film. There's this really great movie called Decasia that is just put together by Bill Morrison, and the soundtrack is by Michael Gordon, and it's just the creepiest music put to silent film that has been decayed. The images are distorted and it's just really creepy music of like ferris wheels of people going on ferris wheels and then their faces are just like you can't see their faces that it, sounds awesome it's really good it it got it actually got added to the national film registry in 2013. it's a treat i i say you should watch it it's it's very creepy sounding decaja is the name of the film and it's about decaying film so you wouldn't really say there's any advantage to using film over digital no if you if you are a professional and you know what you're doing with them, you can probably get the same results with a professional camera. There's photographers who say that there is less discipline with each shot, and I agree, but I think that there's still art to be made with digital because it is more about what you are photographing. If you have the creative eye to see stuff that you think other people would appreciate, it doesn't really matter what you're using. Uh, can I read you a quote by this photographer? His name was Ansel Adams. You know him. I know him, but I know his name. He, I think he has a park named after him. Yeah, there's a there's there's actually a museum there that shows his work. He was a conservationist, but he was also uh, he took a lot of pictures of nature, and he had this really great quote: "No man has the right to dictate what other men should perceive, create, or produce, but all should be encouraged to reveal themselves, their perceptions and emotions, and to build confidence in the creative spirit." I feel like among the professional crowd they they will probably find a good reason or at least a better reason than the rest of us could find for using it the best reason we could find is that it seems cool to use which is not a good reason for anything no it's not no yeah if you have a if, if there's actually a practical reason you have to using this stuff instead of it just being cool then power to you i encourage you to do that don't let us tell you what to do but hey, maybe, maybe some uh, film photographers out there want to tell us we're wrong. You can call in at a... <laughs> <laughs> so continuing in the line of things that are popular, maybe for no good reason, uh, record players. Oof. Something near and dear to your heart. I wouldn't say it's near and dear. I, I have a record player. I enjoy the records that I have, but I don't know if I would necessarily consider it like... Ah, coolness isn't the word I'm looking for. It is a bit cool, though. It is. It is pretty cool. But a lot of other people also think that it's cool. Which we should acknowledge that's a bad reason. That is a bad reason, yes, to do things. Because a lot of people do things because they're cool, like drugs. Records are uh, they're on the rise. According to BBC, at least in the UK, which I think they're, they're buying metrics are going to be somewhat similar to those of the United States. Records, as of 2012, were at their highest point since 1997. And if you look at the trend, record sales have been going up, but they are nowhere near the... I was uh, I was gonna say, I've, I've seen a graph that showed the resurgence in vinyl, and it is, it's nothing compared to how many records that were sold in like the 70s. Yeah, no, no, it's it's nowhere close. Like it's, it, I don't think it's like a 20th. No, it's, it's quite unsubstantial uh, how much they've come back if you look at the whole grand scheme of things. If you if you measured over the past 20 years, 
yeah, it's gone up over 100% in terms of records sold. But if you look at the whole thing, it's a sliver on the whole market. And, and there's a reason why record sales went down. It's because of the advent of CDs and MP3. It's a lot easier to carry your music with you and listen to it wherever you want than it has ever been before. If I recall correctly from that graph I saw, it started declining in the 80s because of 8 tracks and cassette tapes as well. I think those had a big hit in the market. Magnetic tape, I mean, that's been around since the early 90s, but that was more for recording purposes. Recording studios would do that. It was a lot easier to splice things together because the, you'd mentioned this like first podcast, the wax cylinder for recording purposes has been around since it was invented 1877. Was it by Benjamin Franklin? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Anyways, the, the, the wax cylinder was created for recording purposes back in 1877. And originally its purposes were just for talking. Uh, it wasn't, people didn't really think of recording music on those things until about the early 1900s. But people were still afraid of almost like creativity music. Like people, they were afraid that people weren't going to listen to music anymore. 1906, John Philip Sousa said, the time is coming when no one will be ready to submit himself to ennobling the discipline of learning music. Everyone will have their ready-made or ready-pirated music in their cupboards. And continues on to saying, the Nightingale song is delightful because the Nightingale herself gives it forth. They were afraid that we were all just gonna listen to pre-recorded music. No one was gonna go out to concerts. People weren't gonna go to the symphony anymore. Now they're having the other problem. Yeah, everyone wants to listen to music and that no one wants to go out. But it's almost kind of like, we're, we're talking about records in terms of something that are, are they still relevant? But records were originally seen as something that might make live music irrelevant as well. Both are still around to an extent, and I think that live music has definitely held its own far better than the record has. They really enhance one another. I think they do. Because, uh, I mean, if you're going to go see someone live in concert, you're going to listen to their music beforehand. And I think by knowing the music beforehand, you're really going to enjoy the concert as a whole. Totally. It makes it way better. But there are reasons that people still listen to records today. Why do you listen? Uh, I'm going to be completely honest and say I listen to it just for the experience of having a record. I, I mean, I just have a small little player that really has crappy speakers. But I think having the physical medium is... There's just something special about holding something in your hand that does something. It's almost like the experience of having a book as opposed to having an ebook. I, yeah, I could relate to that because I, instead of buying ebooks and just reading them through an app, I would way rather have the books because I, one, just like to have it in my hands and to put it up on a shelf after I'm done with it and just look at it and say, I have that. Having physical stuff is weirdly satisfying. It is. I mean, it's, it's almost like I would rather have a record than a CD, the vinyl, but like as a collection of songs. I think the composition of them has changed since the invention of compact discs and digital. Because now it almost seems like CDs are just a collection of songs. But back in the day, if you're putting together a record, you're knowing that people are going to listen to these things going in one to the other. And it's like, it, it was an album, and today it's just it's a collection of songs. That is... I think that is true because you'll find a lot of people won't really have a favorite album. They'll just have a favorite song that just so happens to be on an album, which is understandable because we have the freedom to shuffle and to skip through. And honestly, I love that sometimes because some albums in their entirety are just not good. But um, I guess that's just what's special about that listening experience is you have to kind of appreciate the album in its entirety. Even though you could get that same exact effect were you to have Bluetooth speakers and Spotify. I don't know, I think records are something that we keep them around for nostalgic purposes, and I think there are a couple of quaint things that we really do appreciate about them, but it's definitely been a replaced medium. I think it still holds its place, but it's never gonna take over again. If anything, it's on the way out. Another niche market for another antiquated item. So I guess the real question of all of us is, is there anything else that, is there anything else that you feel like in the next few years, 10 years, is going to become an antiquated item? Like something that we use right now every day? Yes. I think radio is having a bit of a decline and stuff like this are, is increasing. I'll agree with you, but they've been saying it's on the decline for the past 70, 80 years. It's had many predicted deaths. When TV came around, radio was going to die. There's just a 
bunch of things that have been predicting the kill of radio, but it's always been changing. So I think radio as we know it now, oh yeah, and yeah. it should be. But I think radio in some form or another is always going to have its place. Because podcasts are basically just segments of radio. I agree with you there. That's why I feel weird saying that radio is dying when what we're doing right now could be considered radio. So I guess really the thing is like when when things become more readily available to the public, some version of the original product becomes obsolete. As cameras became cheaper and digitalized, film photography went out. Uh, it's easier now to make your own CDs. Radio, you don't really need an access to it all. But maybe it's not necessarily because parts of it become obsolete, but because more people are doing it, you're able to revolutionize the product itself and become better. Whoa. No, the, the good podcast will stick around and the bad ones could sift it out. Yeah. He'll follow Sturgeon's law. 90% of everything is crap. I know one thing's true though. 100% of us are great. Aw. You guys are my significant brothers. Thanks for joining us today. Mm -hmm.